All right. Hello. Thank you for coming back from the break. I know you have many um, entertainment options out there, and I'm pleased that you chose to spend this with, with, uh, with me here. My name is Eric Sorensen. Uh, I work at Puppet. And I've been working at Puppet mostly on Puppet itself for a long time. Um, I've been there since 2012. And I ran Puppet and CF Engine at scale before I started working on them. So I've been in this config management game for quite a while. And it's mostly been pretty great, but I got an opportunity to jump to a new project last year that focused on cloud native infrastructure and I sort of jumped on that. It was pretty scary, I'll be honest. Um, I had a lot to learn and I had some trepidation that I wouldn't be able to get up to speed. I was frankly a little afraid that I would be the punchline of like an old man yells at cloud joke. But I did the best I could and learned a lot from the people around me and this talk is sort of a summary of the things that I've been looking into and investigating over the past several months. I really want to take a moment here to acknowledge that I'm building on a lot of work from a lot of different people. There are a few spicy takes in this talk, I'll be honest about that, but Overall, I'm pretty just overwhelmed and awed by the amount of brain power in this community, and I'm humbled to be able to contribute to it in, uh, in any way I can. I do have one quick work plug before I dig into the substance. My current project at Puppet is sort of adjacent to all this configuration management stuff. I've been working on a service that's called Project Nebula. It started out as a way to do cloud-native continuous deployment. But our users are finding that it's useful for ops workflows as well. So we're exploring what it would be like to build sort of like a if this, then that sort of service for doing operations kinds of things that are more event driven so they can receive events and act on them uh, in a way that users define. Um, if that's interesting, you, interesting to you, please come and talk to me over the next few days. I'd love to hear what you would do with such a thing if you had it or if you were building or working with similar tools. And that's all for the, the plug. Let's dig into it. So the talk's called Cloud Native Configuration Management, but we should probably start off by asking what does cloud native even mean? This is a fantastic book by Justin Garrison and Chris Nova. Uh, there's, there's a concept that just for definitionally I want to pull from this in order to uh, lay the groundwork and frame up the section. Uh, the, in the book they describe what cloud native characteristics are as being things that run on a platform, that uh, it means that you can interact with it programmatically. Uh, it's a, it has uh, agility, meaning that you can make changes easily. It's operable, that is, you can control the app from inside of the app. You can uh, uh, tell it to reload or restart itself. It has observability, uh, meaning that it's designed to emit, um, ex uh, to exhaust events and log files and uh, traces in, um, consumable manner so that we don't have to treat the application like a black box and poke at it from the outside. And with all that said, you may ask yourself, doesn't that just mean it's good architect it's architected well? You'd be right to a large extent. And so the question became for me, what do we know about what good architecture looks like here in 2020? I went back to this paradigm, it's the 12 factor app. I had originally written 12 factor with an E because I work in Puppet and I've just been doing that for a really long time. <laughs> and I corrected it to say factor the way it ought to be spelled, F-A-C-T-O-R, and it just looked completely wrong to my brain. So I'm just gonna go with this, uh, it's factor. So the, the concept of 12 factor apps came out of Heroku. Um, it's an early platform as a service company It's still doing some pretty cool stuff. Adam Wiggins is the person that published this paper in 2011 describes all of these factors that go into building modern applications. There's some interesting tidbits in here that are, um, rel that are re related to this discussion. Uh, I think a lot of these were pretty prescient. They were pretty er early for, their t for the, uh, the time. Lots of things we take for granted today were laid out in this paper. It wasn't at all obvious back at the time that they were the right way to do things. For example, uh, the idea of declarative autom uh, automation. We've heard you know, this part before. Uh, to have a clean contract with the operating system. That cer certainly wasn't the case uh, for the applications that I was running in 2011, where you'd have to work in concert with the developers to make sure the right version of Ruby was installed on the operating system, and woe befall you if, as Ruben was talking about earlier, there's some application version that got upgraded under, under the hood. Um, 
And so this was really before uh, you know, containers came about too. The, the, these apps ought to be built for the cloud, that is, they should be repeatably deployable and operating primarily over network APIs, and they should enable this continuous deployment, continuous delivery types of cycles. So this shows up in the factors as build, release, run, and around the par having parity between your development and your production environments. Yeah, and this is pretty, pretty forward looking. It predates all the state of DevOps reports, findings, and all of this sort of research that's come out uh, from folks like Jez Humble and Nicole Forsgren since then around how having uh, continuous delivery built into the way that your business works actually makes the business work better and pr produces more money for your company. Um, and there's some specific things in, in 12 Factor about configuration. There's a, a, a litmus test for whether an app has all of its configuration correctly factored out is whether you could make the code base open source at any moment without compromising your credentials. And if not, you should probably rethink how you're doing that. Pretty interesting. I, I wouldn't say it's 100% infallible though. So this is from, these are some of the more, more characteristics. Um, has anybody found here that uh, using cloud applications has really eliminated the need for systems administration? I, I don't think so. Uh, it has changed from what we need from systems administration, so it's worth examining what exactly is different now from when it was from, from the last 10 years. In my opinion, there's a few trends that are actually step function different from what came before. We can argue whether these are the right ones or whether there's more or less over beers, but I have the microphone, so this is what we're going with. <laughs> um, the first one is ephemerality. So this means a shorter, life, uh, shorter lifespan. Ephemerality just means a short-lived short life cycle, um, but it's... Uh, if you have your config management camp bingo card, you can now fill in the square where it says cattle not pets. Uh, I th it should be the center. It should be a gimme. But uh, this, this is the idea of ephemerality is you can no longer care about any single uh, system. You have to be able to treat them as, uh, as not as precious snowflakes, like Ren was talking about earlier, but around part of a larger system that are easily replaceable. Uh, Justin Cormack has been talking about um, systems he, when he was working on uh, the unikernel stuff as being as going from um, cattle to insects because their lifespans were even shorter. They were highly numerous. They're very. Um, uh, the, the, it's it's less about which server produced a failed login, but whether the system as a whole is healthy. I don't think the real world is going down to those mi minute life cycles like you think of an insect being, but the life cycle is now tied to the application release cycle. The next one is about cardinality, and this is something that Charity talked about here last year, and it's been beating the drum for quite a while, that these events have characteristics that you're interested in, and it's not about what server they com came from. It's about how fast they're coming and whether you can dig into the information without having a prede uh, predefined notion of what it is that you're looking for. Um, the interesting bits of data across these distributed systems tend to have high cardinality or the idea of the thing, the, like the user ID is, uh, is going to have a, lo a low degree of un uniqueness across your data set. Our infrastructure really isn't traditionally set up to handle tracing a single user's transactions across a number of services, but that's, that's the place we need to get to. Next important principle is around immutability. You can't change the state on these running systems, uh, particularly in true in container world, but in general, we, we want to get away from the idea that we're, um, and this is difficult for me to say as I work at Puppet, and we've kind of made our bread and butter off of this for a long time, but the idea of running an agent on a system and having that agent make live changes to the state of the system is a no-go. We just can't do that anymore. At Puppet, we've sort of been shifting f away from doing uh, agent-based stuff to more agentless uh, kinds of operations, still trying to provide some of the same model-driven approaches and reusability around modules, but to do that in a way that doesn't necessarily require a long-running agent on the system. Sometimes there's no system to run an agent on if we're talking about a network device or uh, API endpoint, so that, that idea totally has to change. The paradigm shifts to if we want to change configuration, we change it upstream in, in the Git repository, build a new system, and deploy that new system, tearing down the old one. And um, yeah, that's, I, I think that's a pretty, pretty different approach. This one, I couldn't fit into this same 
grammar, so I'm sorry about that, but it's the idea about having a declarative data model for the applications that we're configuring. Brian Grant uh, was one of the early Kubernetes developers. He wrote an awesome paper that's called uh, Declarative Application Management in Kubernetes. If you haven't read that, I highly recommend it. Uh, we'll talk more about it in a minute. The central point relating to this topic is that configuration for these tools should move beyond code and back into the data. Uh, the quote from it, and I'm sorry, I'll, I'll just read this part. We do not want to express configuration as code or some other representation that's restrictive, non-standard, or dif difficult to manipulate. So this is a concept that is probably familiar to Puppet folks, uh, but the Kubernetes philosophy goes even further than that in that it consumes YAML. So in Puppet land, it would be like if you were writing catalogs directly instead of writing manifests that became catalogs. So what's the outcome of all of these, all of that list of properties that re as it relates to config management tools? Um, last year, I talked about this evolution from infrastructure as code. I think this is probably preaching to the already converted here uh, into infrastructure as software, which we've talked about a little bit already today. Pulumi obviously is very heavily into the uh, infrastructure as being representable as um, actual application code. Which is good, but I think it has uh, it comes with it a new set of problems. Like you have to learn test frameworks in order to understand, in order to reason about your infrastructure. Uh, but if we're moving beyond the provisioning layer and moving into serverless architectures where there's no provisioning step, maybe it's better to think about being the infrastructure represented as a data layer that doesn't have code per se in it. So maybe infrastructure as data is the next evolution. Kelsey Hightower has been talking about this a lot recently. Uh, he did a great podcast um, with the Go, on the GoTime podcast uh, where he talks about uh, infrastructure being representable as data. The abstraction moves into the runtime is, what it, is the way he put it. And implementation details, whether that's a Kubernetes controller or the cloud service, are not really visible to the user. So you're manipulating data and feeding that into the runtime, but that's a fundamentally different situation than authoring Chef or Puppet Code. You still have problems though, like how do you feed the right data into those APIs? I think the tools have been trying, that we use have been trying to change as a consequence, and my hope is to uh, help make sense of those changes in this talk. Incidentally, it ended up that uh, this is a tour and a preview of many of the other talks that are going on around the conference. So I'm going to try to point out where they're, you know, where people are giving more deep dives and more specific um, tool talks around this. I may have missed somebody. If so, I sincerely apologize. Also, if I've gotten some details wrong about the thing that you have been working on, that is entirely my fault. I've been trying to, um, like I said at the beginning, come up to speed on these things. I guarantee you I've not gotten everything right. In most cases, I've gone through the tutorials and gone through as much online documentation as I can. And I do have some comments about that, but I'll, I'll save them for the individuals, uh, save them for the end. Um, but uh, yeah, so, so uh, yeah, apologies if I miss anybody, and hopefully this will provide sort of a guidepost if you're trying to figure out what to do over the next couple of days. There's some amazing talks that'll dive into, into some of the things that I'm gonna talk about. And if you recall, I mentioned Brian Grant's paper a minute ago. In it, it has a list that uh, has a link to a Google spreadsheet where people could sort of crowdsource and register their own tools, and so I found out a lot about these. But I realized as I was scrolling through them that there is sure a lot of them. Like, why are there so many? Why do people keep making new tools? Like, <laughs> it's still going. <laughs> I think, it last, I think it stops at like 120 or something like that. And these are just people that cared to go onto the Google spreadsheet and register their stuff. I'm sure there's more out there that people haven't, haven't found this particular resource. But I think that this, this proliferation is a consequence of people trying to come to terms with this new concept of infrastructure as data, maybe without even really realizing that that's what they were trying to do. And so they, they um, made some new stuff. Uh, so, Marcel and I were talking about this last night. Uh, this is a concept called the configuration complexity clock that I'll talk through really quickly. Gareth Rushgrove actually introduced me to this. I found this really apt, and so it's sort of the uh, framing for how I'll talk about the tools in this talk. Um, Cedric Charlie also wrote a great blog post that's called the configuration complexity curse um, it, because we're doomed to repeat the cycle over and over. Uh, the, the way it goes is that if you're writing a new program, you start off with some hard-coded values. 
that uh, uh, just you just you know wire them in there. Over time, you have to extract those so that it's more reusable. So you get to the idea of having these configuration values, and uh, so other so they become parameters, and other people can use it. Uh, you might have some schema that get deserialized into configuration. Uh, but after a while, the application that started out as a late night hack has become a key part of the business and the data injection is complicated enough that it needs its own business logic. Um, in Mike Hadla's terms, he called this, calls this building a rules engine around it, um, sort of like the no, node classification stuff in Puppet or um, the attribute system in Chef. And then there's some things that you still can't do quite right in that, so the configuration now has evolved into its own DSL, and then you as the developer spend more time working on the DSL that people use to configure the values that can inject into the system than into the system itself. And then at some point somebody goes, this is all way too complicated, we have to throw the thing away and start over again. So you get back to, and then the cycle begins, begins again. So. With respect to cloud native configuration management, I think it's useful to make a sort of taxonomy and map where these different tools have landed around the clock. Uh, but the framing is going to be slightly different. That the 12 o'clock is sort of raw config, writing raw, you can just uh, slam in your YAMLs into the configuration. I don't think anybody really likes to do that, and it's not particularly interesting from a tool standpoint, so I'm not going to talk about that stuff. The equivalent. Um, to those config values are uh, this set of tools that are really generators where they take input, combine it with some kind of template, and then produce a static customized output which you then feed into the, uh, into the remote APIs. And there's some interesting work going on here. This, these are generally neat because you get an intermediate representation that you can then do cool things with, like check it into Git trigger GitOps workflows off of that resultant configuration. You can do diffs and comparisons over time. You can validate that and make sure before you actually go live with it that it's going to work. Um, uh, and then the next level is sort of around the, these front, a set of front ends where this is the, the rules engine in the, pre, in the original, but this is an application that you're interacting with that is doing the behind, behind the scenes work for you. And then there are, in fact, full DSLs. At some point, that complexity catches up to you, and people move into either a domain-specific language, or maybe at the 10 or 11 o'clock, a full programming language, like uh, some of the things that we've seen today. I'm going to cover a couple of noteworthy examples, and this is by no means exhaustive, or you know, there's plenty more stuff here. I apologize if you have something that you have been working on and care passionately about that I haven't covered. There's just there's a lot. Um, so let me dig into it. We'll talk about generators first. Um, so we have a Capitan. Has anyone heard of Capitan? Who's using it here? Looks like there's about 10-ish people. I'm going to do quick hand surveys, and I'll read them back because not everybody can see everybody. Plus, it's being recorded for posterity, so that's what that's about. Uh, Ricardo Amaro is going to be talking about Capitan, so if you find this interesting, please go look up his talk. To me, Capitan is interesting because it uses a um, version of a tool called Reclass as the source of truth for injecting values into the templates. Reclass was originally written by a guy named Martin Croft, who goes by Mad Duck online. He may actually be here somewhere, I don't know. Um, it it's, uh, started life as an external node classifier for Puppet and then became a dynamic inventory source for Ansible, and it serves a similar role for, for Capitan. Uh, reclass is really powerful because it allows for this composition and inheritance of different values. Uh, Capitan then injects the values into Jinja 2 templates or other kinds of, or, or um, uh, JSON it to produce configuration that you then feed into your system. Like I said, that allows for some nice properties like it you know, compiles them into neat folders and then you can uh, perform Git operations, re re revision control, and those sorts of things on those intermediate artifacts. Uh, another tool that's, that's similar to that, I'm going to give a shout out to Lee Briggs, who's been talking about this problem for a couple of years and has some very good blog posts on his blog about, uh, about the subject. Um, his writing informs a lot of this talk, in fact, and I, I really recommend checking it, checking it out. Um, Lee tried a number of the tools that were out there, but nobody had quite hit the niche that he was after at the time he started writing this, and the upshot in his words was, oh shit, we're going to have to write something. Um, 
Create uses sort of a two-pass system that builds up YAML from templates and JSON it. And the, ex the code example I have here, the top half of this, I get to use my cool green laser pointer now. Um, the top half of this has the definition that needs to be met and it, it's underlined in red squigglies there because it's failing the definition that it has provided for those things and generating errors. The bottom half is the actual configuration that gets blended together to make sure that it passes validation. And uh, JSON, it has some nice facilities for manipulating these kind of data structures. So if you can see on lines mm, two and nine on the bottom, there's this plus syntax that's like a merge. You can also do deep merges so that different levels can contribute different keys inside those hashes. When you run the command line, it outputs YAML. And again, you can check that in or feed it into, into kubectl. Uh, next up is a, s oh, yeah, sorry, the builds are confusing to me. I just did those last night and I probably should have left it be. Uh, next are some front ends. Uh, Tanka is a tool that came out of the Grafana uh, organization. They use it for configuring the Kubernetes infrastructure that underpins uh, Grafana Crowd, uh, sorry, Grafana Cloud. It's derived from a tool that's called Case on it, which you might, imagine from the name as the Kubernetes application of JSON it. If you have a Kubernetes related tool, it's like a law that it has to start with a K. You gotta drop some vowels and start with a K. Um, but um, Tank is interesting. It has a K in it, but does not actually start with a K. Um, they, they loved uh, case on it, and, but wanted to simplify it. Again, I have to give a little bit of, throw, uh, of a question mark here because if you love case on it so much and it was abandoned by the authors, why not just pick it up and keep working on it? It's an open source tool, had a pretty active community. It seems like, again, we could maybe give up with some of the wheel reinvention and, uh, and, and unify around things instead of splitting everything out. The justification, and I do have some sympathy for this, so it's not entirely like um, you know, throwing shade on them, but the justification was that case on it had a number of levels of abstraction that were too complicated and they wanted to strip down and make something simpler. So uh, in Tanka, the only sort of level of, the only concept that you have to work with is around environments that you, that um, is, is how you build up your configuration. So it provides an interesting point of contrast with Create, which I talked about just before, both use JSON as the thing you actually write, but Tanka doesn't have an intermediate format that you view and check in to get. It just applies the configuration directly and it has more of a command line interaction loop where you do uh, get a diff and apply and JSON is doing most of the work here. And I do like the idea of authoring primarily in JSON. It seems like it's got some, some neat properties. Um, I had some trouble getting it working personally because I guess there's a JSON at package manager. Like that, I got a little wrapped up in that, but that's probably just me. I did get it going and I like the simplicity of just having this one layer of overrides and inheritance. It starts, I have the file system tree here. It starts down at the deepest level of the, um, uh, of the directory tree that has your uh, configuration in it and um, mer merges upwards until it hits the, hits the root. Uh, and it tries to resolve all those values into one big JSON object, which is then translated into YAML and fed into, into kubectl. So there's another, there's a talk here, Malcolm Holmes will be talking about this tomorrow afternoon uh, at 2.50. Um, Yeah, and one neat feature about this is, uh, again, if you, as I said, it has a command line loop where you do diffs against it. If you're running a new enough version of Kubernetes, it'll use the server-side diff and show you not just what it thinks the diff will be, but actually has a facility against the um, Kubernetes cluster API to show you what's different from what is actually running in the cluster, reducing one of those sources of um, drift. Helm uh, is up next. We have some Helm talks too. Um, it's interesting to me, not just because it's used by other tools, but because the evolution of Helm itself is like a trip around the complexity clock. Early versions used special, it's a, yeah, sort of a package manager for Kubernetes. Early versions of it, you see at the top V1, you could um, comment your uh, shell scripts and Helm would process those and do variable substitution on them. As you might imagine, that didn't uh, go very far. Um, so they moved to doing, uh, 
um, t Go templating in, the, in Helm v2, so you can do these sort of mustache uh, interpolations. The, problem, uh, the problems that people reported was that the syntax is a little obscure, and again, you still had this kind of mishmash of two different languages where you had to reason about both the YAML that you were interacting with and the values and the, the actual programming logic that was inside of those, the, uh, the templates there, which can get really confusing. Helm v3, uh, this was originally slated to be in 3.0, and it is not, as far as I can tell. I think um, it was uh, pushed out for a little bit, but there are, there are multiple templating engines, even in Helm 2, and they're carrying that forward into Helm 3. The idea, though, is that you can write your Helm charts in Lua as a, as a little embedded language and use that so that you're not switching back and forth and the language is sort of compact and understandable enough that you're not spending a ton of time worrying about syntax and how things work. Um, it, uh, you can just write, you know, for, do, do simple programming stuff there. So again, that's kind of like one tool's evolution that took it all the way around to, um, to the place where the ecosystem as a whole is, is landing. The interesting thing to me about Helm is that the ability to supply values into the templates and into the into your charts hasn't really kept pace with the evolution of the um, the tool itself. The problem of where do the values come from that get interpolated is sort of left as an exercise to the reader. You can provide them in a, in a YAML file and there's the idea of a little bit of overrides and inheritance in the values. You can supply overrides at execution time, but if you're used to something like Hira or some of the other tools that do this, uh, it feels a little, uh, a little primitive, no, no, no offense. There's a talk today by Tomas about Helm and GitOps and a deep dive tomorrow afternoon by Martin Hickey and Taylor Thomas about this. So hopefully I, I will learn what I've gotten wrong about this, uh, this run through. But I am, I am interested, it's like Lua is a fun little language and it's cool to have the idea of like, we're just gonna go full bore and not try to shoehorn uh, logic into what's supposed to be a data, data model template, but actually give you the power and expressiveness of a real language. Uh, Pulumi, we just had a very energetic talk about pr Pulumi, so I'm probably not going to cover it too much. The, the idea is just, you know, Terraform programmers, as we heard, they're multiple language bindings. So again, the idea is that if you want to go full on and interact with it with a programming language, you can do that. Um, yeah, Paul both has a talk later today. I think he's doing a whole workshop on Wednesday, too, if you really want to dig into it. Uh, one interesting thing relative to... Um, something like Terraform, which we'll talk about next, is that Pulumi uses cloud-based state by default, and um, uh, although you can, you can change out where that, uh, where that lives, by default, when you do the Pulumi up, uh, it will store the state that it's managing on their, on their service, and that way you can have multiple people interacting with it, and that's also, incidentally, how they make money. So it's, a, it's an interesting quirk of both a technical design plus a business model. Next up, we'll talk about some domain-specific languages. Uh, and I don't, probably don't need to introduce Terraform for this crowd, so I didn't have a code, code sample here. Um, we've got a whole track, basically, here at the conference of Terraform content in 105, B1105. James Nugent is going to talk about organizing your code, and my former colleague from Puppet, Shoba Shafsni, she's going to talk about uh, Vault and Terraform integration. I think Terraform's great. I mean, the, there certainly is some devil in the details, but the main strength that it has going for it is this provider ecosystem that's just massive. Uh, I've been using the cloud service for some of my own projects, and I think it's really cool to have the Terraform plan functionality available as a CI step. If you, uh, if you set up Terraform Cloud with the GitLab or GitHub integrations, it will register itself as a CI for your Terraform repo and run plan whenever a new change gets checked in and um, make sure that you, you know, sort, sort of like you see when you do Travis CI, it'll, if it fails a plan, you'll see that in your pull request, which I think is awesome. Um, I've talked to a lot of Terraform users over the past year and a half. I, I hear some similar complaints about the language that uh, feel really similar to me of the things that people complain about the Puppet DSL for years. I think the most relevant for this talk is that the language has very strong guardrails around what you can and can't do with it. Uh, but sometimes you need to do things outside of the model. In Puppet, people had exact re execs, or you can just, you know, put shell scripts in there, you can do whatever you want with it. 
In Terraform, there's like null resources and provisioners where you, you can effectively like circumvent the model and put anything that doesn't fit inside of those things. For example, for the service that I'm working on for the Nebula service, um, our deployment Terraform has a remote exec provisioner that just has like a 200 line SQL migration inside of, that, uh, inside of the provisioner line and there's no resources in there to do ordering for Helm deployments. And I'm not saying that's bad or like we're terrible at Terraform, although we might be, um, but that when there's a Restrict, when there's restrictions on the tool that go against the way users need to use it, people will find a way, like Jeff Goldblum said in Jurassic Park. Like, <laughs> life will find a way, and it's, it, it's incumbent upon, you know, if you, want, if you really want your stuff to be broadly applicable, to provide a built-in way for people to be able to accomplish what they want, otherwise they're gonna go around the, the, uh, the, the edges of it and push people into, into weird behavior. Has anybody heard of Gyro? <coughs> mm, sort of, Bob, um, a little bit, uh, but nearly nobody. I, yeah, that circumvents the next two questions about whether anybody's using it in production. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it was just announced, uh, to be fair, just announced in um, October, had a first formal, formal release in October. Uh, it's a tool from a company called Perfect Sense that uh, uses it internally for their hosting operations and decided to open source it, kind of clean it up and, and publish it. Um, these are some examples from the doc. It has a custom DSL and a CLI for interacting with it for mostly uh, for you know, doing cloud, cloud provisioning. I'm not, uh, definitely not dunking on the project or you know, the people that are working on it, but I do want to point out that this is like, number one, a really difficult way to get an open source project off the ground these days is to take an internal tool, flip, flip the repo to public, and then expect that the world's going to beat a path to your doorstep. Um, the, it, you know, maybe um, five or six years ago you could do that if people really like caught into it and you had enough of a of a, a high enough clout score, people would come and use your stuff, but clout shut down and the world has sort of moved on into these more foundation driven open source models. And so it's really hard to go it alone as a single vendor, let alone a single sort of main, main author open source project and get a ton of community traction. Um, and they have to, they build all of the, um, the cloud providers themselves. And I have to ask why. Um, they're, they're, it's written in, as I said, written in Java, and I, don't, I just don't think there's going to be a huge open source community of people that are going to want to write Java to extend the tool to talk to the cloud resources that they care about. Plus, this DSL is heavy enough syntax, you have to spend some time and energy learning it that you can't then translate to other tools, so that's, it's, a, it's a question mark for me. Um, Uh, Starlark is an interesting project. Starlark is uh, a small dialect of Python. It's a, like kind of a subset of Python that it's intended just for doing configuration. So you get the properties of Python's data manipulation syntax, you, but you can't write files or, un, or manipulate the underlying system. Starlark just runs at the beginning of a program's execution to produce configuration and then exits and hands it off to the real, real program. It's interesting because it's sort of similar in concept to, you know, like kind of two stages of public catalog compilation. The Starlight program, it just runs long enough to hand it off to the real program. Just like in public, you generate a catalog and then that's handed off to the agent or, or for Bolt. Um, it, the, it's got multiple implementations, so if, you're, you, if your actual program is written in Java or Go or Rust, you can still use the same configuration syntax, or you can, that's portable across, uh, across programs. And I first got into this because uh, there's a proposal to use this for uh, Tekton, which I have, uh, which we, uh, Nebula uses Tekton as an upstream open source, and we've been working with them. So this is sort of an interesting potential um, upstream um, uh, change that, that might make it more expressive and powerful to write pipelines. Uh, Q, we'll talk about Q for a minute. I'm really interested in this. It's um, a language, Q stands for configure, unify, and execute. And Marcel's uh, here, he's, he's the primary author of it and is gonna give a talk about Q, I think later today or tomorrow. Um, 
it's a data constraint language. So it merges the idea of schemas and data definition. So a key feature of this, of, of this idea about constraints is it's not about inheritance. You can't inherit a, a concrete value from a higher, a, a higher object and then override it. You can only override parts of the schema. So it makes it really easy to um, to reason about why a field got a particular value, which is something that inherent space systems really lack, and something that in um, Hira we've been, you know, lots of people struggle with. If people have complicated Hira setups, I've seen I've seen things that you wouldn't believe, like people that have 28, 29 levels of hierarchy in their Hira, and they it works for the one person that can have that entire thing in their brain. Everyone else on the team is like, what is your, what even going on here? Um, you, that sort of thing is not allowed in Q. If it sees, if you see a concrete value for a field, it's guaranteed that that's going to be the final result. That's a really, um, really valuable property, and one I wish more systems really thought about. Um, it builds, yeah, it builds all of these nice things directly into the language. It's kind of a, DS, a domain-specific language over the domain of configuring things. So uh, I think that it's 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 very cool. I'm interested in working working more with it. So let me wrap up with some lessons learned from all of this. Um, the first one is that complexity is going to chase you. The world is a complicated pa place, and tools that are too simple they end up shoehorning in that complexity instead of ma actually managing it. So you end up with YAML engineering, overloading simple things and making them unusable. But if you're writing something new or you're working on something, wait until the last minute that you have to in order to start running and start layering on more things because uh, it might not be necessary. You might end up with something that's like highly complicated and two people use it and that, that makes, you know, it's kind of a waste of time. So wait until you're actually getting chased. <laughs> so the next lesson, uh, constraints and specifications above all else. Whatever you end up using, think about that comment about Q. Constraints are really powerful and the main win is just that, like I said, it's unambiguous about why you have a particular value. Uh, I think people that have used either the chef attribute system or complicated HIRA setups or um, di dynamic data injection that comes from an external system into, or dynamic inventory, sorry, that comes in from external systems for Ansible. Uh, if there's something hard to reason about, that means it's hard to troubleshoot. If it's hard to troubleshoot, that means it's hard to fix when something goes wrong with it, something goes d down at 3 a.m. Uh, you don't want to be groveling through that stuff trying to figure out where that value came from. I would say too that with apologies to Arthur C. Clarke, any sufficiently advanced YAML dialect is indistinguishable from a DSL. And if you have written a complicated set of YAML and do not have a specification written in your documentation for what fields exist, what fields need to exist, what fields are optional, then you have made things a worse place than when they started. So please do that. Um, you can use something like JSON schema to uh, describe the fields. There's a neat little library that we've been working on called uh, D that uses kind of like a uh, puppet, puppet type system sort of syntax, but much simplified in order to do expressive type validation. At the bare minimum, just write a readme somewhere that has the list of the fields that you have, because that, that'd be great. Next one, please. I beg of you, <laughs> stop making new DSLs. I had a boss who had a sign uh, on his wall that said, rule number one, there's no new problems. Rule number two, if you think you found a new problem, see rule number one. I think about this a lot because as I've been going through this tool ecosystem, I see a ton of wheel reinvention. I don't know whether that's people don't know their history. They think they know it. They think it's something to be ignored because nobody else was as smart as them. I'm not sure. But we end up somewhere on that complexity clock regardless of the problem that you're trying to solve. And so if there's one thing that uh, I hope they'll take away with this is please don't make DSLs if you can. If, what you can do is take one of these small languages that are made for configuration like JSON or Q or, or um, Starlark and build the minimum amount of tooling on top of it. Or better yet, again, find something else that's already out there that's close enough to what you are trying to accomplish and just join forces with those people. Um, uh, 
it's it's people are much more it's much better to have you know ten people working on a project than have five people working on two projects each. So I'll close with uh, another quote from uh, a paper from uh, Brian Grant and uh, John Brewer, some of the original um, Kubernetes authors. They said um, one of the the man, you know, one of the hardest problems that they have is this managing configurations, applying value. In fact, uh, we could have devoted an entire article to the subject and still have more to say. It seems like we could uh, devote an entire conference to the subject for eight years and still have more to say. So I think we're, we're, we're doing the right thing here. All right, thanks very much. <laughs>